Hey, good morning, church. Awesome. Well, uh, this morning I've been asked to do the announcements, so uh, just a few things to hit really quick and we will get things moving. Um, we just want to, uh, first, before we do anything else, extend just a, a, a huge, huge thank you to you guys for how you supported uh, the Wild Game Supper last night. It was an incredible time. Uh, it was my first ever one, so I had no idea what to expect, and it just completely blew away my expectations. God moved in miraculous ways. I think we served over 300 uh, people here at the church yesterday and probably close to 400-something meals total sent out yesterday. So that was just incredible evidence of God's faithfulness. And we had an awesome time just hanging out, fellowshipping, and um, seeing God do, do awesome things. And that is because of, of what you guys have done in helping uh, uh, support that. So thank you guys for that. A uh, couple quick things. Uh, tomorrow night at 6, there's a care meeting. There's going to be a light dinner served. Um, tonight here on campus, uh, Superbook Children's Academy, our student service is meeting right over there at 6 p.m. For any students, 6th to 12th grade, and then their service tonight in here at 6 o'clock and dinner tonight at 5.15. Um, I'll have you read with me if you have your Bible, Psalm 34, and then I'll pray and then we'll get going. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. As we do that this morning, corporately, church, let the praise of the Lord be fresh on our lips. Because he's been good to us. Amen? Amen? This morning we pray for our pastor um, and we pray for our church, our nation, and the nations around the world. Father God, we come. God, um, first and foremost, we lift Pastor Walter um, before you this morning. God, your word in Hebrews tells us that we can come directly before the throne of grace Seek and find help when we need it, God. So we are asking this morning that you wrap Brother Walter up in your arms, God, in your healing arms, God, and do a mighty work this morning. God, we've seen you do it time and time again, and we know you can do it again now. So we come asking and expecting you to do big things because you are a God who does big things. Father, this morning as we come as a church to corporately worship, gather, and praise, and exalt the name of Jesus Christ in this place, we ask that you be present move. God, bless our speaker this morning. God, if there's someone here who does not know you in the forgiveness of sins, today be the day that that changes. God, you convict their heart, draw them into repentance, into the family. Father, we love you, we praise you, we bless you, and it's all in the name of Christ that we pray. All God's people said. Amen. All right, Dan Fly. Church, stand with us this morning, and uh, before we sing this, Neil, you can go ahead and start playing it. There's a face in the choir that hadn't been here in the choir for a long, long time. Raise your hand, Brenda. So thankful she's able to be back. She has four more tough chemo treatments coming up over the next several weeks. And uh, please continue to remember her in prayer. Well, he mentioned the psalmist. The psalmist in chapter number 96 said, Sing unto the Lord and bless his name. Let's do that right again, right now together. Okay, bless the Lord.
day that will be. thinking while we were singing that brother Anthony you know our, our human minds have a hard time comprehending what will be in heaven we talked about it a little bit in Sunday school the Bible said that eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard and neither has entered into humans hearts what's mm -hmm. really there we have trouble getting that but one thing we can get is what won't be there no more sadness no more sorrow none of those things that song mentioned and, and then the writer in Revelation 21 said there won't be any more of those ruthless, call callous, evil, wicked people destroying and killing people. And there shall in no wise enter in, in, in anything that defileth, neither anything whatsoever that maketh a lie, neither any works of abomination, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. You can be seated. We want you to keep singing with us. Before we do, I want to mention, I guess you noticed our beautiful carpet this week. You kind of got the smell a little bit. I believe our chairs are going to be in next week. So we just thank the Lord for all that and all the workers and all the construction and Matt's leadership all, and all that. I'd like you to give him a hand right now. A lot of work, a lot of time goes into this. Amen. How many of you are glad today that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, redeemed you? Amen. We're going to sing that. I apologize. We don't have any books out there. Since we're changing chairs, we don't want to put any out and just have to take them back up. But the words will be on the screen. The choir is page number 38, 38 in your hymn book. You sing with us, church. Sweet is the song. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed.
are going through this world of woe this hand still leads me where I go this hand has led through shadows drear and while it bleeds I have no fear I know it will lead me to that home where sin nor sorrow e'er can come they trust in death the unseen hand that guides me through this weary land and some
Amen. I'm putting Brother Jonathan on the spot this morning, church. I came in, uh, I usually come in a little early and get a few things ready, and he was sitting at the piano tickling the ivories, and uh, I didn't know he could do it and do it so well and singing a song, and I said, Brother Jonathan, I'd like you to sing that in church today. And uh, He said, Jeff, I don't even know the last verse. I can't remember. I said, well, we'll get your wife to look it up and write it down for you. <laughs> she did. And he said, Jeff, you know that's a funeral song. I said, yeah, that's okay, but you know it talks about heaven. And, you know, heaven is a place where the Lord's throne is, where the Lord is. It's our eternal destination. I'm never ashamed to sing about heaven because that's my destination. That's the goal. Yes, Jesus came to give us life, connection, give it more abundantly. And we have that here with him. But, you know, uh, some people, some of you are getting up the age, I hear you say, you know, I've almost got more over there than I have back here. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And it's a, it's a funeral song in some other ways, too. And it'll bless your heart any way about it. So, Brother John, just, you just relax. Holy Spirit's got this. Just minister at her hearts, brother. Check. Okay. I haven't played piano in about two years. So if this is a disaster, it only lasts three minutes. <laughs> when time has gone for my leaving And I must bid you they do don't spend your money for flowers, just a rose will do. Because I'm going to a beautiful garden, Lord, when all life's work here is through, no, don't spend your money for flowers is just a rose will do oh just find me an old-fashioned preacher to preach me out of some other two no don't spend your money for flowers is just one rose to do. And I need no big organization to make up a big do. And I need no bright decoration. Just, just one road to do. <laughs> because I'm going to a beautiful garden when all life's work here is true. So don't spend your money for flowers. It's just one row to do was just one row will do. Good morning, church. Good morning. Jonathan, you need to repent. You lie. <laughs> it's been two years since you I played. Huh? 
That's good, brother. God gave us different gifts, and I'm glad you shared yours with us. Um, preaching for us this morning is uh, Brother Josh Parker. He's a pastor at Cool Springs Baptist Church in Chapsler. Uh, a month or so ago, when Brother Walter was getting over COVID, I asked Brother Josh if he could come preach for us, and he couldn't. He had other obligations, but he felt bad. He said, you let me know again in the future if, if you need me, I'll try to make it. And so I called him last week. He said, I'm going to make it happen. I said, no, I don't. And so I said, all right, so you can come Sunday morning? He said, yeah, I'll come Sunday evening too if you need me to. I said, hallelujah. <laughs> so Brother Josh is going to preach to us this morning and this evening. And let him know how much you appreciate him taking time to come be with us this morning. Brother Josh. <laughs> It's an honor to be with you this morning, and all the way up to Chatsworth, but thank you for being here. If you got your Bibles, let's go to Acts chapter number 16, Acts chapter number 16. Nothing fancy about me, I know who I am, but I do know who God is, amen? amen. God made everything right that was wrong in my life at an early age. He saved me at five, and called me to preach at a young age, then I began to run from that call to preach, and I ran for 17 some odd years uh, in my life, and... Uh, Got out of the will of God for my life, but the Lord worked that out, and he worked in my heart, and was loving enough to let me come home, amen? And he's always been faithful to me, so I stand here today knowing that I am an imperfect person, but I just want to preach about a perfect Savior today, amen? Anybody knowing to be perfect in your life? Am I the only one? Anybody knowing to be perfect in your life today? All right, well, I hope you do know him to be perfect, because he's perfect in my life. He's been good. I've always found him faithful. I've always found him to be faithful to me when I need him. In Acts chapter number 16, I don't know if you stand when, when you read. If you do, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine as well. We'll be throughout this chapter today, but I just want to begin reading in verse number 22. Read down to verse number 31. And we'll just give you a little thought in our heart today. I believe there's passages of scripture that we can read that will be instrumental in our life. And I have found this passage to be instrumental in my life. And Lord will help us this morning when we want to look around this thought of how to have revival at any moment. Is it possible to have revival at any moment? I believe it is, and the Word tells us how that is possible today. We're looking in verse number 22. The Bible says this, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the inner prison, charging the jailer, or cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. And who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. Verse number 25, if you underline or highlight anything, you ought to underline these three words. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. I like verse number 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword. And he would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for, we're all, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. And brought them out. And listen to what the jailer said. And he said, Sirs... What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and all that were in his house. And he took them that same hour of night, washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. I'm interested, verse number 25 is kind of where we'll build around those three words. And at midnight... Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask you to help us now. Lord, I know who I am. I know the unworthiness inside of me, but Lord, I know the goodness of you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us now for the next few minutes to be faithful to the calling that you placed upon our life. Lord, pray that we'll be faithful to the text. Lord, we'll not add anything to it. Lord, we'll not take anything away from it. For at the end of the day, your word is settled in heaven forever. Lord, let your Bible do the work in the hearts of men that are here. If there won't be one here that's lost, Lord, convict them. Lord, show them of the Savior. Lord, if there be one here that's just needing revival today, 
Lord, I pray, God, you're doing eternal work in their heart. Bless us now. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen. I said this. The thought we're looking at around this morning is how to have revival at any moment. In this text, we come into Acts chapter number 16 here. We come into this story and we understand that we're at a midnight hour. We understand we're in the darkest part of the night in these men's life, in Paul and Silas's life. Midnight is a dark time. It is a uh, darkest point of the night. It's the dead of night. Midnight's always that part of the night where everybody's asleep but just you. But I found this in the midnight hour. Troubles and worries are always there, aren't they? You ever been there? Midnight when everybody's asleep, it seems like troubles and worries arrest your mind. They arrest your heart. They arrest your soul. But I'm glad that even in the midnight hour, it's not just you. If you're a believer, the Lord is there with you in the midnight hour. So in this text, we come this morning to a midnight hour. And Paul and Silas are the character. And they are in a prison. The text explains itself how they've ended up where they are. And we'll break that down this morning and just give you a couple little things that I believe will answer or a prescription, if you will, on how to have revival at any moment. So, preacher, what are you talking about revival? Well, that word revival means an improvement of or a, uh, an improvement in the condition or the strength of something. I thought about this. It's a comeback. It's a renewal. It's a uh, revelation or, a, if you will, it's a resurrection. As I think about this passage, I think, my, how we need personal revival today. Amen? I need personal revival. Anybody else need revival in their own life? I need it every day because I know who I am. I understand that outside of the covering grace of God, I am nobody. I understand who I am. I am wretched. Paul said there's none righteous. No, not one. But I understand how good God is. I know God knew my past, my present, and my future, and yet he still loved me. Amen? I need personal revival every day. I need to be reminded just how good God is. And then I believe in the day and time we're in. I believe churches need corporate revival. Amen? We need it all over America. We need a comeback, a, a, a resurrection of things of the Lord, the goodness of God. And in this text today, we find a prescription how to have this revival at midnight. Paul now is on his, uh, well, he's on his second of three journeys through the Roman Empire. Paul's on his second mission work, and he's came into this city called Philippi. And I want to ask you for the next few moments as we back up to verse number 12, I want you to go with me on a journey, if you will. Don't worry about what we're going to eat for lunch. Don't worry about what we're going to do tonight. Let's immerse ourselves in the text. I learned a long time ago, if I'll just take that text and immerse myself in the Bible, I almost feel like I'm walking the footsteps of Paul. You say, how do you do that? Just, just clear your mind of everything else. Don't worry about what's going on later. All that's sufficient for the end. Let's just get in the Word of God and let it take us on a trip. And that's where we're going to go. Verse number 12, back in the beginning of this chapter, this is where we catch up with Paul and Silas. And we'll briefly run down through it, give you a few things, and we'll be short before you're hearing this morning. Verse number 12, it says this, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony where we were in that city abiding certain days. So we find here that Paul and Silas, our characters, are coming in to Philippi. And it said through study and reading in Philippi, we understand Paul would have been coming there to begin a new church work. He would have been coming there to start this church in Philippi. And through reading and uh, facts of that area, it said that at the outside gates of Philippi, there would have been some kind of sign or a monument of something, some sort, that would have been stating as soon as you walked into the city gates of Philippi that there would be no unrecognized religion. They wouldn't allow anything out from the outside coming in. So Paul and Silas coming into town, they already understood. They're going into a place that does not believe like we believe, and we're bringing the gospel in here. They already knew the the. the Troubles they may face because they already saw the warning on the sign saying we're not going to allow anything that's unrecognized coming in. So Paul and Silas would have known that here in the beginning of verse number 12. Look with me in verse 13. It said, and on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a river or by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made. Paul and Silas left out of the city so they could go and honor the Lord in prayer on that church day, if you will, on their time for service. 
They went outside of the gate, respectful of those customs, but they were still going to serve God. Amen. They were going to find a place where they could worship and serve the Lord. So we find Paul and Silas going outside of the gate. Well, there's so much in this text that's so rich that you can study. So it says, and we sat down and we spake unto the woman which resorteth thither. There was a woman there. Verse 14, it says, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. You'll hear that city mentioned again in Revelations chapter 2 and 3 where the Lord causes John to write seven letters to a church. It's believed that in Thyatira, this would have been the first convert that Paul and Silas would have led to the Lord here in Philippi and she would have took the gospel back home to Thyatira. That's an extra one. You can study that in Revelations 2 and 3. But they come upon this lady named Lydia and she comes to know the Lord. They share the gospel with her. So they're doing their daily routine. They're just living their Christian life. They're going outside the gate, respecting the law there. In verse number 16, it says here, it changes. There's, a, there's another character that comes into the story. It says, and it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of deviation met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. This woman comes upon the scene now in verse number 16. And she comes to where Paul and Silas are at. This woman with gainsaying or soothsaying, she's a fortune teller. She's, able, she's possessed by a demon, that, and she's able to tell fortune. So she comes upon them. Look with me in verse 17. It says, the same followed Paul and us, cried, saying, These are the men uh, that are the servants of the Most High God, which showed, us un uh, which showed unto us the way of salvation. Verse number 18, it says, And this she did many days. So every day as Paul and Silas were trying to make their way outside the gate to go and observe prayer and do their daily routine as a Christian, amen, it'd do us good to go pray every day, wouldn't it, amen? It'd do us good to be in service for the Lord every day. They're going out that way outside the gate. This damsel comes upon them, this woman possessed with a, a spirit of deviation, this soothsayer, she's almost, if you read it, you could make it out that she was mocking them. She's trying to bring attention to them and get them in trouble. But all of a sudden, on this day, in 18, verse 18, it says, But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And she came out, or and he came out that same hour. Paul just said, there's enough with this. This is enough. Now, he called that spirit out through the power of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Call, Paul called that spirit out. He said, there's enough. Now, here's where the story begins to really get serious. Here's how we get to this prison hour. Verse number 19, it says, And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. That, that, that woman's uh, rulers, if you will, the ones that were profiting off of her soothsaying, they said, oh, no. Now this man has cast out this demon, and my, now my profits are gone. You start digging in my pocket, now we got a problem. This, these, these rulers get kind of irritated now. And they go to Paul and Silas, and they arrest them. They, they do a citizen's arrest, if you will. They grab them. Verse number 20, and they brought them to the magistrate, saying, well, this is good right here. Brought them to the magistrate, saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Amen. Wouldn't that be good to be known as somebody that troubles the city for Jesus Christ? You say, well, I don't know if I want to know that if I'm going to jail. That's what we ought to be willing to do. We ought to be willing to trouble the city no matter the cost. Amen. You know why I want to trouble the city? You know why I want to trouble the world? You know why I want to trouble, trouble the devil today? I have no problem admitting it to you because I'm a sorry, low-down dog that God seemed to see fit to save me and love me and has kept me every day. Boy, I could preach right there a minute. I know who I am. I know what I, I want to trouble the city for a God that loved a poor old rotten sinner like me. Amen. I want to trouble the city for a God that loves the drunkard down the road. Amen. Loves the demon-possessed one down the street. The dope addict that's on the side of the road. I want to be one of those ones that trouble the city for the Lord. And let me say this as an extra before we move on. If you ever get known as somebody that troubles the city for the Lord, don't be surprised when problems come your way. Don't be surprised when the world unleashes everything they can at you. Don't be surprised when the naysayers come. Don't be surprised when the murmuring comes. You just keep your head forward, amen, because what a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see, amen. There's going to come a day when we get to the end of this journey, and if we've troubled the city, we've made a difference for the Lord, and I'm looking forward to that day. So now they've come, and they've caught Paul. 
Verse number 21, they make their case for them. They say, they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither do observe uh, being Romans. And the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes. Man, and the magistrates commanded to beat them. Do you understand who this is in this text? This is the prince of preachers. This is Paul. I'm talking the man that's responsible for writing the majority of your New Testament. Amen? Paul, the prince of preachers, he is now being beat. You say, man alive, I don't like that. That's why a lot of Christians don't do the work we're supposed to do because we don't want to get beat. This is the prince of preachers now, and he's just minding his own business. Might I, might I remind you, he's not done anything wrong. He's just cast out a demon in this woman's life. He, he's done something for the good, but now all of a sudden problems come and troubles come, and now Paul is fixing to be beaten. Verse number 23, and when they had laid many stripes, it wasn't just one stripe, it wasn't just one smack on the back, it was many stripes. Paul was not just read from a little hickory. I'm talking there was lacerations, if you study this out, that he would have been lacerated. I'm talking he would have been broken. Him and Silas both did not just endure some little minuscule reprimand. No, they had been beat. Man, th man, this is hard. I hope you're with me in the text. I hope you're on this journey. Imagine being Paul now. Imagine thinking in the back of your mind, Lord, all I'm doing is serving you. God, all I'm trying to do is do what you've called me to do. And now again, I'm, I'm beat. Now again, I'm facing prison. Might I remind you that the majority of Paul's writing was written in a place of prison. It was written in a place of sheer suffering, if you will. It was not written with cherries on top and everything great. Now Paul is beat. They laid many stripes upon them, and they cast them into prison. It says, charging the jailer to keep them safely. In verse 24, he takes his charge seriously. This jailer takes it seriously. And he binds them now in chains, in stocks. He's got them in a stock. You ever seen a picture of a stock? Those old chains, medieval stocks, they would have chained their hands, locked them in under some pieces of wood. Their neck and their hands would have been in. Their legs would have been chained. And some of them would even say they would have been chained from their hands to their feet. Now this is Paul. Chained for serving the Lord. Chained. Now you would think, one would probably deduce that because of where he's at, He's probably not real happy. Could I submit to you this morning? You may say, well, I'll never have. I'm glad we don't need to have him back tonight. That preacher admitted this. If I was Paul, I would probably be ready to give up right about now. Would you be there? It's okay to be honest. Would you be ready to give up right about now? Anybody? I would be ready to say, Lord, now this is just about far enough. I just don't know if I can take any more. I, I was fine, Lord, serving you outside the prison. Now you've got me. I'm just about as far as I can go. Now Paul is chained, he's fastened, and all of a sudden we come to the darkest part of the night, Brother Daniel, the midnight hour. We could say a lot about the prison, it was a bad place. You could study a lot about the inner prison, that was a part inside the prison. The prison was bad enough, but then to get thrown into the inner prison, now you're put into the place where the worst of the worst of the worst was housed. That's even worse. I mean, this story is just rough, but all of a sudden at midnight, Two cats change the story right here. Two men change the story at midnight. The darkest part of the night, the loneliest part of the night, no doubt they must have been questioning God. I, I believe I would. I believe you probably would too. No doubt they're worried and they're concerned. But something changes at midnight. I'm trying to get to my text here. I'll always have a long introduction and a real short message. I'm almost there. I'm on the city limit sign of the message and we'll get out of here. But I want you to understand at the darkest part of night, what were they facing? They were beat. They were bruised. They were bleeding. And they were chained. So I, I just can't wrap my mind around having that happen to me. The Lord's been good enough to allow me to fulfill my calling in this part of my life. Even though I ran from it for years, he, he stayed after me. He dogged me like an old coon dog. He, he barked at me and howled at me and got me to the place where I had to get right with him and serve him. He made me get to that place. And I'm so thankful tonight. 
I remember what it was like to be in a prison. I remember what it was like in the dark hours and not wanting to do anything, trying to hide it and trying to run. But God always ran just as far to me as I ran away from him. Amen. And at midnight, I want you to get somewhere now. These two men, now this is just me. I'm goofy now. Y'all just have to follow me. Think about it. Now they're, ch they're, sta they're chained and in stocks. Paul's on one side of the jail. He's sitting over here. No doubt he's hurting. No doubt he's in pain. No doubt he's, he's, he's broken mentally. He's broken spiritually. He's broken physically. And he's sitting over here bound in chains. And I wonder if Paul thought, Lord, is this all I've got to look forward to? Lord, why am I in jail again? Lord, why am I beat again? Lord, why am I having to deal with this? And on the other side, over there in the middle of nowhere, in the dark, might I remind you, this is a prison back then. They didn't have power. They didn't have TV and air conditioner. Silas is on the other side of the prison. He said, Paul, I was just following you. I was just doing what you told me to do. I was just trying to serve the Lord and follow you. And Paul, we're in, what in the world? We're in prison now. It's just me. Paul on the other side of the prison said, well, Silas, all I know is Silas, it may be bad right now, but God's still good. Amen. It may be dark right now, but God's still faithful. Paul said, Silas, I don't know about you, but the pain ain't going nowhere. We ain't got no Advil. We ain't got no Aleve. We don't have no Johnson & Johnson first aid kit, but we do got the Lord. And what did Paul do at midnight? Paul chained in stock said, God, dear Heavenly Father, I don't know why I'm here. God, I don't know why you've got me here. But God, I do know you called me. You met me on Damascus Road when I was headed to, to kill Christians. And you appeared unto me. And you changed my life. You took me who was a murderer and changed me, God. And now I'm in prison. But God, if I have to be in prison to be where you're at, amen for the prison. Amen for the chains, God. And Paul began to pray. Have you ever got somewhere where you just couldn't do nothing but pray? Am I the only one? Anybody raise your hand if you've ever been there. Have you ever got to the place where everything was falling apart? Hell was blowing up by the acre. And you didn't know what to do. That's where Paul is at at this very moment. He said, my life makes no sense. Nothing makes no sense to me. But the only thing that makes sense is God in heaven. Amen. The one that changed my life. And if all I can do is pray, that's what I'll do. I can tell you in some of the darkest parts of my days, the only person I could talk to when mama wasn't around, and dad wasn't around, and granny done went to glory. And amen, I felt like the Holy Ghost was a thousand miles from me. There was something sweet in prayer. Because I could just get still. And just say, God, I don't know what else to do. And I began to pray, Brother Matt. I believe Silas over there thought, man, Paul, I want to pray too. If that's all we got, I want to pray too. And Silas began to have prayer meetings. And I just believe in those dark parts of the night when all you can do is pray. I've always found God faithful to show up in my situation. God will show up in the prison of your life. He'll show up in the bedroom. He'll show up on the side of the road. He'll show up in a cattle pasture. He'll show up on a telephone pole at work. He'll show up wherever he's got to be as long as you'll call on him. I promise you this. He'll show up in the middle of a mess at home. He'll show up in the middle of a mess in school, at church, and everywhere if you'll just call out on him. Paul and Silas began to pray. You say, preacher, how do you, how do you get this? Well, I'm just following the Bible. The Bible preaches itself. It says that at midnight, Paul and Silas began to pray. They said, all I know to do is pray. They didn't stop there. I believe Paul was starting to feel better. All of a sudden, those Holy Ghost chill by. Yeah, has the Holy Ghost ever come by your way? Amen, believer. Have you ever been where you just pray and all of a sudden there's a sweet peace? It just feels like he almost just wraps you up. Amen. He just comes by and wraps you up. And he says, don't worry about what's going on out there. Don't worry about what's going on in the world. I'm here. Just wraps you up with that sweet peace from above. I believe Paul and them were feeling that. I believe the Holy Spirit stepped on the scene. Paul said, you know what? I know that I know this is a hymn. Now just, just follow me. I know they didn't have the church hymnal back there in Philippi. But I believe Paul might have sang some kind of song similar to the church hymnal. I believe Paul might have said, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. 
Amen. I wonder if Paul began to sing something like Amazing Grace. How, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amen. Paul began to sing and said, if prison's all I got, then prison's all I need. He began to sing about what a day that'll be. When my Jesus I shall see, there'll be no more chains. There'll be no more bars. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more pain. And all of a sudden, friend, Paul began to sing. And I believe Silas said, Paul, let me get one in. Let me sing a verse of that. Silas might have said, well, maybe he sang victory in Jesus. Maybe he sang something like that. I promise you this, they sang a song. You say, how do you know it? Preach the text tells me they did. It says, and at midnight, they prayed and they sang praises to God. Now, that's great, ain't it? You can have church in any situation you're in, but look what happens in the text. When they began to pray and sing praises, i got to hurry. They prayed and sang praises. Look, verse 26. And suddenly, didn't take a while, Brother Matt. It was suddenly, it was automatic. I mean, it was just while they were praying, while they were singing, all of a sudden, there was a great earthquake. Imagine that. Imagine praying sometime. Could you imagine that happening to you? Knelt down praying, singing, and all of a sudden the ground began to shake. It'd probably mess you up, wouldn't it? <laughs> I wonder if Silas said, Paul, did you do that? What'd you say, Paul? How did that happen? And all of a sudden, the ground began to move. You know what that was? That was the Holy Ghost. Welling up in the prayer and the praise of his people. The ground began to shake out of nowhere. And Paul and Silas, I guarantee you, they sung a little louder. I guarantee you, one of them prayed a little bit harder. And all of a sudden, this ground began to shake. There came an earthquake. All the foundations of the prison were shaken. Imagine this. All the doors just fell off the hinges. Silas, Paul, what are you doing? Keep on singing. Sing that third verse again, Paul. Sing that chorus again, Paul. Let, let's sing that again. Paul, pray that prayer again. The doors fell off. Man, that, that's great, ain't it? And everyone's bands were loose. All the chains fell off. I'm trying to get somewhere how to have revival at any moment. Paul and them are in the worst part of their life. Now they prayed, sang praises to God. Even in the middle of their situation, an earthquake's come. The doors are off the prison. All the chains are gone. Now, I don't know about y'all, but this is just my goofy self. If there was an earthquake and all the doors fell off the jail over here at Gordon County Jail, you reckon any of them fellas are going to stay in there? <laughs> no, Sheriff Mitch is fixing to have a problem. He's fixing to call 911 and get everybody at his disposal to come find them prisoners because they're getting out of there. But now, something's different in this text. All the chains were loosed. Everybody's in prison. The worst of the worst. But then in verse number 27, and the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, seeing that the prison doors were open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. I believe he thought, well, there goes my pension. They'll never let me retire. Boy, that's the end of my job. I'll never get another raise. I'll just kill myself. But Paul says, hey, do thyself no harm, because we're all here. Nobody's gone anywhere. What? Nobody's gone nowhere. They've had revival in the prison at the midnight hour. That's why nobody fled, because they said, I want to be where God's at. The lost man, probably, those prisoners probably got saved at that very moment. They, they believed, they said, man alive, whoa, I've never seen it on that fashion before. They didn't leave, friend, why didn't they leave? They wanted to stay where God was at. So all the, all the prisoners were there. Paul said, hey, do thyself no harm, we're here. He called for light and spring and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let me give you three things. How can we have revival at any moment? This text gives us a prescription for a revival. It gives us an instruction. You say, preacher, that's a wonderful text, beautiful story. It's a beautiful story how everything changed, but how can that affect my life today? How can I take this Bible, this text, and put it in a place in my life? How can that happen? How can that change my life? If you'll apply it in your life, I promise you. It'll change your life. That word prescription means this, an instruction or a recipe means some advice or a method. You want to have revival at any moment in your personal life? You want to have revival in any moment corporately? We can have it at Cool Springs Baptist Church. I can have it personally in my life, and you can have it in yours. If you'll apply, not Josh Parker method, but just apply the Bible method. Amen? Just follow what the text says. How can we have revival in any more moment? Number one, you better pray. When all is wrong, when everything is going wrong, and you feel like you're in the worst place of your life, get out on your knees and call out on God. 
The Hebrew writer said, therefore, now come boldly before the throne of grace. Amen. What a blessing to know. I don't know if that helps y'all, but it helps me because I know who I am. I know the things about me that nobody else would care and would discard me and throw me away. But the Holy Ghost and God himself knows about me. And yet he loved me and yet he still pursues me every day. And when I think about that, I'm not going to some man be pan be fake God. I'm going to the God that stepped out on nothing and created everything. I'm talking to the Son of God that grabbed the stars and turned them into bars and walked down into a little, uh, little young virgin's belly and was born and lived and died and rose again. Amen. You want to have revival in your life, get out on your knees in the worst part of your life and say, God, I don't know how I got here. I don't know why I'm here, but I do know you're the only one that can help me. I do know that you're the only one that can be for me what I need. That's just the text, friend. That's exactly what they did. Pray. That word pray means to talk to God, to supplicate, to earnestly supplicate to be sincere one of my favorite verses about prayer is in first peter 5 and 7 it says casting all i'm so thankful for that three-letter word casting all your care upon him why because he careth for you that means everything that thing that people think is minuscule to them but means the world to you that means cast it on him that one thing that you don't want to talk about that one thing that you don't want to tell anybody take it to the lord amen that one worry that one fear that you don't want to relinquish to anybody take it to him why because the god of glory cares for you now i don't know about y'all but that ought to make the holy spirit do do cartwheels in your in your spirit today that the god of glory wants to hear from you you want to have personal revival you want to have it right now this very moment today get on your knees and take every care take every burden take every worry take every fear to him because he cares for you but then secondly praise paul said that the text says at midnight paul and silas prayed and they sang praises praise him sing praises to him get you a song sing you that one song that you love the most Talk about how good he is. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Amen. Whatever song it is that matters to you, how great thou art, whatever it may be. I mean, any song, anything. You got, I love all kinds of stuff. As long as I love all some music, as long as it uplifts Christ. Amen. I'm all for it. If it's Christ's honor, I'm all for it. Whatever it is that matters, whatever song trips your trigger, makes you think about the Lord, amen, and gets you above it, just sing it to the best of your You say, preacher, I can't sing. Well, I can't either, but I do it in the car. I ain't going to do it in church because you'll, you'll be like, man, that guy's awful. But I can sing in the car, amen. Pick you out a song and sing it, amen? I promise you, studies show that singing has a direct effect on the human body. It lifts up the spirits. When they're down, takes the focus off the negatives and energizes the heart as nothing else will. You ever come into church on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or Wednesday night and you think, man, I hope nobody knows the hell I'm facing. Hope nobody can see the pain I'm going through. Anybody ever been there? Come in just so weighed down, just beat down by life. Don't even know if you can make it another moment. But all of a sudden, the choir director gets up and begins to sing a song. You begin to sing about the Lord. And all of a sudden, something down in your heart begins to stir. That piano player hits the right key. That soloist hits the right note. And that song just begins to trigger something in the Holy Spirit in your life. That music. That praise. And we're commanded all through the Bible to praise his name. Amen. To give him praise. Sing a song, friend. I know it's bad. I know it's hard. I know life's tough. There's a lot about life that I don't understand. But I do know this. I'm saved. Amen. And I ain't worried about it down here because I just got one trip around the sun. But brother Matt, one day when I die, I'm confident that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so shall I ever be for eternity. And he'll make it all clear then. So I'm not wasting time worried about the mess down here. I'm just going to pray and praise his name. Amen. And when we'll do that, all of a sudden, revival will come. The Holy Spirit will begin to move. The problems fade. That's what happened in the text. Let me give you this in closing. They pray. You want to have personal revival? You pray. You want to have personal revival, corporate revival? You praise, even in the hard times. But then proclaim. What did they do? When everything happened, the chains were bruised, the prison walls were shaken, the doors were off, they shared the gospel. Amen? And somebody responded. 
You don't understand why that jailer responded. He probably faced the same thing these men had faced. He faced in the same life, the same devil, the same problems that these men faced. But he said, I couldn't react the way they did. I didn't have the peace that them men had. Their hard time, their troubles, the road that Paul and Silas had walked down. All them three bedroom, two bath potholes you might drive through in life and have to stay there a while. If you'll just live for him in those, even in the good and the bad, somebody's watching. And somebody's going to see how you react and how you live through them. And somebody will want to know what you know. How do you know that, preacher? Because he came to him and he said, sirs, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? What do I have to do to get what you got? What do I have to know to know what you have? What do I have to get? What do I have to do to be able to be that happy? Beaten. And in stocks. He didn't say the prisoners were beaten. He didn't say they were in stocks. They were just probably sitting over there in the corner. Their case was bad enough, but Paul and Silas's was even worse. What did Paul and Silas do? They proclaimed. They told. They showed. They revealed the gospel to this man. I promise you this. If we'll apply those prescriptions today, we'll pray in the hard times. Praise in the hard times. Proclaim in the hard times. Tell somebody just how good God is there will be a byproduct of revival. There will be a byproduct of personal revival. You say, preacher, well, we ain't had revival yet. Well, we, sometimes we get that word revival mixed up in the church. We, we, we say, well, we're going to have revi revivals, not for the lost. I mean, you, you don't have a meeting for revival for the lost. You're there to revive the believer. Amen. You can't never be revived if you've never been revived, if you've never been saved. Revival, though, here tonight was to revive these two men that were hurting. And when they got revival, they proclaimed the good news of the gospel. And there will always be a byproduct of revival. If you'll have personal revival or corporate revival, there will be a product. Product means a thing or an action that is a result or an action or a process. If you'll praise God, Brother Daniel or the worship leader, however you handle the closing, if you come forward here this morning and get a song together, I want to I challenge the church this, as I would challenge anyone. If you want to have personal revival, apply those steps in your life. Pray, praise, and proclaim. And I promise you this, if you'll do that, somebody's watching, somebody's listening, somebody's looking, and somebody will catch the good news of the gospel, and they will respond. They will respond at some point. You say, how do you know it, preacher? Because I caught it. I saw it in someone else, and it moved in my heart. And I've talked to countless people. It said they just responded to the Lord because somebody loved him and prayed, praised his name. Let me ask you this today all over the church. Say, preacher, I need personal revival. Would you lift your hand? I need personal revival. Amen. We all need it. We all need it today. How do you know that, preacher? Because everywhere I've preached at across America, since I surrendered to the God, I find plenty of room for plenty of people to be in a church. Amen. We got it at our church this morning. There's plenty of room for them to be there. We need personal revival. That way we'll pray and we'll praise and we'll share. We can fill the church up, amen? Any place. There's personal revival needed. I want to challenge you this this morning, believer. If you're saved and no heaven's your home, maybe you're just facing something hard. Maybe something's gone on in your life that you don't understand. Can't make no sense of it. You feel like you're in prison. Feel like you're in a midnight hour. Would you come to these altars this morning and just say, Lord, I just, I just need to talk to you. Would you come to the altar and pour your heart out before him? You say, well, don't think crazy of me, preacher. Well, let them think crazy. Whatever people think about me, think it. I know who I am. I know what I've done. But I do know this. I know who God is. And he's fixed everything that was wrong in my life. So this morning, if he spoke to your heart, and you feel like you're in a midnight hour, why wait another moment? Just slip up, come to an altar, pray to him, talk to him. Ask him, say, Lord, meet me in the prison. Meet me right now. And you may say, well, preacher, I... You're kind of, kind of stepping on some stuff I don't understand. I don't know who that Lord is. I don't know who that God is. If you don't know him, I'd get up where I'm at. I'd come to an altar. And I'd say, Lord, I don't know you, but you know me. And I'd like to receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. And I promise you, in the middle of the mess you're in, whatever it may be, he'll meet you in that prison hour. And he'll give you personal revival. This lasted, this revival lasted. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Because when they had personal revival in the prison, they led the jailer to the Lord, and it went home, and it lasted at their house. And his whole family come to know the Lord. Ain't that a blessing? Ain't, ain't that good how good God is? 
can never give you just enough. He'll do even more. He's Ephesians 3.20, God, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. What's your verse? What's your song, brother? What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not care. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness take it to the Lord in prayer forsake thee take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee take we'll find a solace there and 36 of that same text we don't focus on it much we'll look at revival but that's what happened here in the altar people done business with the Lord look what verse 35 and 36 says I'll read it it says and when it was day the magistrate sent the sergeant saying let those men go God stepped in and made everything right he said let those men go verse number 36 and the keeper of the prison told them say it told this saying to Paul the magistrates have said let you go now, therefore, I hope you'll catch this. He said, depart and go in peace. When the prison's shaken, midnight comes to pass. The psalmist writer said, weeping may endure for a night. But he said, joy cometh in the morning. I don't know what you're going through today. Leave it at the altar. Cast it on him. Have personal revival. And the Lord can let you go in peace. The problem is people won't always let you go in peace. Once you're buried at the altar, 
take it down in your life, don't ever go back and pick it up. Go in peace. And live in that peace. You say, preacher, how do you know that they did that? Because this was just in Acts, the very beginning of the church. Paul journeyed on through Philippi, Galatia, Ephesus, Corinth. Had peace to go forward. Wound up in prison again. Wound up beat. Wound up on shipwrecks, in storms. Paul said, I know what he did for me back yonder. And he can do it again. Thank you all this morning.